back now, I want to say thanks to Frank Blair and Jack Lasculli and to many, many other people who uh, worked through the night, the entire NBC News staff. Our people on today don't normally work on Saturday, but in order to bring this special three-hour telecast of today uh, to you this Saturday morning, November 23rd. Something I'd like to do now, a member of our group, Rick Ballad, has written an editorial that so closely parallels my exact feelings in this case that I want to share it with you, and the best thing I can do is to read it to you. When tragedy touches the young, the gifted, the loved, we can't help but ask why. Why this particular one at this particular moment, at the very height of his powers? Why did John F. Kennedy survive the terrors of shipwreck in the South Pacific and rise to the highest elective office in the land, breaking precedents of age and religion on a journey through 46 years of a storybook life, only to be struck down without warning by a mean, unworthy, an unseen assailant on that particular street on that particular day. When we contemplate this brutal and senseless destruction of a great man, our agony is almost more than we can bear. We face the awful silence of the universe, and we long to cry out to God as the nagging wife in the waltz of the Toreadors cries out to her husband, Why won't you let me inside your head? We judge life and death and the merits thereof by our human standards. And we demand answers acceptable to our human brains. But somehow, no matter how hard we try to comprehend the mind of God, we must of necessity fail. In the end, we must return to the acceptance of an ultimate reality that is possibly forever beyond our ability as men to know. John F. Kennedy was a religious man. He knew these things. He accepted them. He had fears. All men have some fears or they could never gain wisdom. But the fear of death was never present in him. He walked among the people, confident, unafraid. He worried far more about whether his police escort would inconvenience other Americans than he did about the possibility that one of those Americans would take his life. It is unlikely that John F. Kennedy, were he to assess his manner of dying, would call it unfair or that he would demand of God the reason why. Men of courage walk with death and they do not question it when it comes. By now, it's clear that he possessed a wife who matched him in character. It sometimes seemed that every woman in the world was bent on imitating Jacqueline Kennedy by looking like her, if possible. So awe-inspiring has been her fragile beauty. But now she has given us something else to imitate, something profoundly more important and lasting. Within the space of less than four months, she has lost a child and her husband. The beauty of character she displayed is something we might all wish to emulate when we are called upon to face tragedy in our own lives. Yesterday, in her hours of torment, her innate sense of dignity carried her through even when her mind was numbed by the horror of what she had seen. She placed the mantle of her dignity and her love around one of the most ugly scenes in recent history. If anyone ever epitomized the expression grace under pressure, it is Jacqueline Kennedy. As a pathetic side note, we might point out that she is now entitled to a pension of $10,000 a year and the right of frankage, which means she has the right to send her letters without stamps. This is a clumsy, almost meaningless gesture to the widow of one of the most wealthy presidents in our history. But it is forgivable on grounds that no law devised. 
could make up to Jacqueline Kennedy or her children for what was taken away from them yesterday on a Dallas street for reasons known but to God. The weather in Washington is now attuned to the mood. It's gray. It's begun to rain. Vice President Johnson is in his office in the executive office building just across the street from the White House. He's been meeting for some 20 minutes now with Secretary Rusk. We're now waiting for the arrival of Secretary McNamara's car. He has an appointment in 10 minutes, and then we expect to see Mr. Eisner arrive about a half hour later. Uh, Mr. Johnson uses the office across the street, his vice presidential office, uh, out of respect uh, to Mr. Kennedy. Sandra Van Oker has been covering activities inside the White House. Um, yeah. Ray, the press office has announced there's going to be a briefing at noon. We may know more about funeral plans. We don't know anything at this moment. They have a family burial plot at Holy Hood Cemetery in Brookline, Massachusetts. That's a suburb of Boston where the president was born and where they buried their infant son, Patrick, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, last summer. He is the only member of the Kennedy family buried there. Uh, over in the East Room of the White House, the uh, casket is on a catafalque or raised platform. It's covered with an American flag. There's an honor guard from the four services. Two Catholic priests are praying in attendance. And there are candles and a uh, spray of flowers. The casket the, is closed? The casket is closed. Mrs. Kennedy, we understand, is still here. We do not know where the children are. We assume that they are at their uh, grandmother's, Mrs. Auchincloss, Mrs. Kennedy's mother. And, uh, of course, as you said, we're waiting for the former president, General Eisenhower, to come, and the officials of the government, and then for the rest of the day, high officials of the judiciary and the Congress and diplomats will view the casket uh, as it remains over there. You know, the first uh, morning that you and I talked together on television at the White House was January 20th, 1961. Remember what a different morning it was, what an exultant morning. I was seeing Mr. Eisenhower out, you were seeing Mr. Kennedy in. Yeah, the old order changes, and here the old order is changing again. And it's curious, you know, when the new president meets the cabinet officers, protocol dictates that the cabinet officers offer their resignations. Oh, now, I, I don't imagine that happened this morning when he saw Mr. Rusk, for example, or yesterday when he saw Mr. McNamara, because I understand that President Johnson indicated he wanted the cabinet to stay on, oh, because the most important thing that the administration now feels is the sense of continuity. And uh, he's emphasizing national security affairs, but if you look at the White House, it's more as curious. It's almost in a state of shock. It's almost a you poignant the, note. You see these aides as you look in the window, yeah. just walking uh, rather aimlessly, wringing their hands, looking down. And in the, in the press room, for example, on the bulletin board, there is still a sign-up list for Thanksgiving at Hyannisport, President Kennedy's attendance next Saturday at the Army-Navy game. It's just standing there as sort of a poignant reminder the things seem to be just standing still at this moment here. I was interested to see who was with uh, President Johnson this morning as he came out this door. Uh, he was with Judge Homer Thornbury, a, a congressman from Texas who was about to be appointed to judge. He's an old, close associate uh, out at the convention when Mr. Johnson uh, became uh, vice president. See the nomination, Mr. Thornbury was, Thornbury was in the entourage. And also with him was Bill Moyers, his former assistant who's been with the Peace Corps and who now, I assume, will come back to the White yes. House and assume a very responsible position. Well, it, it, the president, the late President Kennedy's staff, what I've been able to determine this morning is being very deferential to the new president's staff, asking what they should do, how they can help, and, uh, and in turn, President Johnson is being deferential, asking them to stay on and give them any assistance. And I think it was, didn't President Truman who said he felt like the world fell on him? Yes, yes, indeed he did. And uh, he's emphasizing, of course, the national security affairs this morning. There's some talk that he went to the Situation Room here in the White House before he went over to his offices in the executive office. Yes, I saw Mr. McCone, the head of CIA, arrive. He went inside the White House while uh, President Johnson was there. Mick George Bundy, uh, Mr. Kennedy's national security assistant, was there. And I, I assume they conferred and were brought up to date on Vietnam situation. The only member of the immediate...
seen since 4.30 this morning when the Attorney General came with Mrs. Kennedy. Oh, uh, that's Mr. McNamara's car just arriving. Yes. Uh, the only other immediate member of the family is uh, what's come as Sarge Shriver, who's the uh, Sergeant Shriver who's head of the Peace Corps and the President's brother-in-law. He came with two children. He may be talking with them about arrangements for the funeral. Secretary McNamara has just arrived from the Pentagon. His Cadillac has just gone in the courtyard inside the executive office building. Uh, we assume uh, Mr. Rust will be coming out shortly. Mr. McNamara is going in. In the meantime, it's, uh, as you can see, raining rather heavily. Uh, what's going on in the East Room now at this moment? Nothing right now except that the, uh, the guard is there, the casket's there, candles are lit, and they're just waiting for the... Well, I assume the family is... Uh, well, we don't they were to go in after 10 o'clock. They were to go in after 10 o'clock, and uh, but we haven't seen any at, at this end, and uh, that'll be very private, and uh, then the official protocol list will start at, well, in about 50 minutes from now. Well, that's the story here at the White House. Uh, Mr. McNamara has an appointment in five minutes. Mr. Rusk should be coming out. President Johnson is in his office on the second floor of the executive office building. Anything more? Nothing more now. Senator Van Oker, Ray Scherer, at the White House. The President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, meeting with his key advisors, his two cop cabinet officers, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, who's in charge of administering this country's foreign affairs, and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who is charged with the nation's security, as he assumes the burden of office. Lee Oswald, charged with the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, was arrested within moments after the president was felled in Dallas, Texas, yesterday. Police have convinced themselves that he is responsible for the crime. They say that they are convinced largely on the, uh, the, the burden of physical evidence. They have received no confession from the man, no admission uh, that would uh, connect him with the crime in any way. We have uh, just a, a note here that uh, the ailing 75-year-old father of President Kennedy was told today that his son was dead of an assassin's bullet. Joseph B. Kennedy Sr. is 75 years old. He suffered a stroke after his son became President of the United States. He has not been able to uh, walk since, and we are told that he has extreme difficulty with his speech, that the only word that he can enunciate clearly is no. But as we were saying, Oswald is under arrest. He is charged with the crime, but as yet the police have no word from him that would connect him with the, uh, with the assassination. It's all physical evidence. But we would like a report on that now by going to NBC's Tom Pettit at the Dallas City Hall. It is just after 9 o'clock here in Dallas, and full-scale activity is resuming at the headquarters of the Dallas Police Department. Down there in this third-floor corridor, a crowd of cameramen, reporters... Newsmen wait for a possible appearance of the man accused of killing President Kennedy and a Dallas police officer, Lee H. Oswald, 24 years old. Oswald himself is up on the fourth floor in the jail section of this building. Oswald is held without bond. He has spent the night under a specially heavy guard. Details of the continuing investigation are largely secret at this time. Police have told us they have 15 to 25 witnesses in their case against Oswald. None of them, we are told, saw him pull the trigger of the rifle that killed the president. Three, according to police, saw him kill policeman Trippett. Here is uh, Deputy Police Chief M.W. Stevenson and Chief, what exactly is the status of the investigation at this moment? The investigation at this time, of course, is in full force. We are working all of the men we have around the clock and attempting to run down leads on it, obtain witnesses, get affidavits, and follow up all leads that we have. Now, is this in the matter of securing additional evidence against Oswald or possibly finding accomplices? I would say it was primarily to follow through on information and evidence that we have obtained from witnesses and information we've obtained from witnesses up to the present and new witnesses. Any witness that we can find that might have the smallest information at all in regards to the case, we want to talk with him. As we understand it, no one actually saw this man pull the trigger of the rifle that apparently killed the president. Is that correct? That is correct up to this time in our investigation. Now, what do you intend to do with Oswald himself? Oswald was filed on, as you know, shortly before midnight for the murder of President Kennedy. He was arraigned before a magistrate 
and was placed in a cell on the fourth floor of our city hall, which is our jail. He will remain there until we have gone further with our investigation. I don't know just what time we will interrogate him further. Of course, that would be speculation. But what we do next in this case, as in all cases, depends on what we're doing now and how it turns out. Does he continue to deny that he had any part in killing the president? He did at the last time he was interrogated. Now, what is your speculation as to what the motive may have been? I try not to speculate on any crime. I don't think it pays to speculate on a crime. Is there any feeling among the Dallas police force that this might have been avoided? None that I know of. As far as uh, being avoided, certainly you might say that it could have been avoided had you had someone in every window and every building. But the feeling among the Dallas Police Department, as it is with every other citizen in the country, is one of deep grief and deep regret. Thank you very much, Chief M.W. Stevenson, Deputy Chief of the Dallas Police Department. I take that to be Sergeant Shriver standing on the second step there, looking out, waiting for someone to arrive. With uh, State Department Protocol Chief uh, Anger Biddle Duke. The lying and repose will continue until uh, six, six o'clock this evening, uh, another more than six hours. And then there's to be a cortege to the Capitol. At one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the body will then lie in state uh, after the president's body arrives at the Capitol building until uh, tomorrow night, and then uh, for a brief period... Dick Monday Mariani, night. what have you just seen? Uh, General Eisenhower and President Johnson, both looking very grim-faced, have just entered the executive office building for a conference uh, upstairs. They entered with Mrs. Johnson. Uh, they left the White House and walked across Yes. The no, they drove in in the limousine, followed oh, by the Secret Service Black Maria. Uh, would you say again, who was with Mrs. Johnson and... Mrs. Johnson and President Johnson and former President Eisenhower. What you do, you go in a, uh, into a courtyard and get out of the car and go up a hallway to an elevator and up to the second floor. That's the way this is done. And the reporters, photographers are bivouacked on the first floor. We haven't yet been permitted except to uh, briefly to view the scene this morning. We might repeat uh, some of the foreign dignitaries who will be flying to Washington for the services for the late president. French President de Gaulle is expected to fly from Paris tomorrow. The British, foreign min uh, British Prime Minister, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, and representing the Queen of, of Britain will be her husband, Prince Philip. And I imagine that uh, in the next several hours we'll be receiving reports of more chiefs of state and important dignitaries who will, will be coming to Washington for this solemn occasion. The front of the White House has a particularly grim look. You can see black crepe draped on either side of the black entranceway draped high above the White House. There's a lot of crepe in the East Room. Marine guards, Navy guards. They seem to be reforming here on the front steps of the White Putting House. Putting raincoats on them, I believe, uh, for protection against this rain. Uh, I noticed the first uh, contingent that came out about 9 o'clock this morning were without raincoats, and the rain started to fall. They were uh, brought back to be replaced by another group wearing protection against the rain, and now I notice that uh, this new unit that marched in just a moment ago is equally prepared to cope with the extremely inclement bad weather we've been having. I'm told that Mrs. Kennedy is bearing up very well. Those who saw her this morning said she was completely composed. It seems to me that she has had more than her share of, of tragedy as of the wife first of Senator Kennedy, who underwent a horrendous back operation, and then as the wife of the president, losing her son. It's been suggested by many people that yesterday, Mrs. Kennedy may well not have appreciated, and being as she was in a state of near shock, she may not really have comprehended. Uh, most people in this nation did not, but to her, she was at her husband's side when he was felled by the assassin's bullet, and it, it was a nightmarish uh, activity, and perhaps it is only today that the full impact of what has happened uh, is really, really sunk in on Mrs. Kennedy, and it's true that everyone who has talked to her this morning uh, indicates that she is standing up admirably. 
it's curious that uh, although she hasn't made many political trips, what with her other preoccupations, that, that, that she should have been along at this, at this fatal moment. And tragedy, of course, has struck the family twice in a very short period of time, the death only four months ago of uh, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, who died after only three days of life, and now, of course, the death of the president. One can make out, I think, a case that the, that the whole Kennedy family is, uh, is, uh, is a thread of tragedy that runs through it. Brother, Brother Joe Kennedy being killed during the war, and Sister Kathleen uh, dying in 1945 in a plane crash. Uh, one sister, as you know, is in an institution. It may account for one reason, or maybe one of the reasons, why the Kennedy family has always been a close family. They have known tragedy, and they have been drawn together even more closely because of, of, of what has happened to them uh, through the years. And to the mother and father of the late president, uh, I'm sure this is an overwhelming loss and, and their grief we will never comprehend. One often talks of them as a family which has everything, wealth, opportunity, brilliance, but now into this equation you must put a full measure of tragedy too. Well, this is the solemn scene at the north portico of the White House, cars arriving and departing. I notice there are more people across the street now on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, they're carrying umbrellas. Some are newspapers on their heads for protection against the rain. I don't suppose we've had more than 250 people here. Last night, uh, some six persons uh, or groups brought over bouquets, private citizens who would stop off at the northwest gate here at the White House and present bouquets uh, to the White House guards for presentation to Mrs. Kennedy. Another arrival. These are deputy secretaries, undersecretaries in the various government departments. This is Teodoro Moscoso, who is the director of the Agency for International Development. Mr. Moscoso, who directed uh, the Alliance for Progress, one of the first... Uh, who spent last week down in South America with Avril Harriman trying to... Uh, yes, trying and the Alliance was one of the, the first, uh, first things that... Uh, instituted by President Kennedy after assuming the presidency in January of 1961. The alliance was the creation Certainly one of, of his president. high marks in foreign... That's this David Bell, Bell's the director of the agency, yes. Director of the Foreign Aid Agency, former director of the budget and his wife. They're now coming in rather rapid fashion, you can see here, the members of the president's family, official family. And it's still raining. At, uh, if anything, it's raining even harder now. I'm not sure that our viewers can really get this. And now, Robert, we have a report on Mrs. Kennedy's activities. We switch to Merrill Muller. While dignitaries are arriving at the White House, we can relay this report to you on Mrs. Kennedy. NBC cameraman George Sozio, who was filming at the White House this morning, reports that he saw Mrs. Kennedy take the two children into the East Room where Mr. Kennedy's body is lying. This was about 10.40 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Mrs. Kennedy was heavily veiled, but did not appear weeping to Sozio. The two children were not crying, but they were clinging very closely to their mother. She brought them out of the room after a few minutes, and then the other members of the Kennedy family went into the East Room. Once again, we go back to Ray Shearer at the White House. Uh, more arrivals. Mr. Harriman, the uh, Undersecretary of State, had just arrived. Here's another dignitary. Mr. Harriman and his wife have just gone inside. Continuous procession here. Cars this is President Johnson, I believe, uh, Sandy. Yes, the Secret Service men are directly behind him. They are moving north now on West Executive Avenue. I, we have no idea where he is going. We're heading toward Pennsylvania Avenue. We'll follow the cars and then... Uh, I would imagine they probably are going home. At least they're heading in a northerly direction and northwest to Spring Valley where the vice president has a home. The only scheduled appointment for President Johnson this afternoon is uh, with the cabinet. Uh, I don't believe we've received a specific time on that issue. 2.30, two thirty is it? Sandy, so, have you heard anything more about uh, chiefs of state uh, who will be arriving in Washington for the funeral service? We understand that Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, uh, the British prime minister, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, and uh, Prince Philip, representing the uh, Queen of England, will also be here. And, uh, Premier Khrushchev, who went to the American Embassy today, I understand, is sending Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko. The cars, I might say, went around uh, uh, went around Lafayette Park. Uh, they're heading uh, in an eastern direction. It's possible that it's 
possible that, that, the vice, that President Johnson is going to the Capitol. I would suppose that if he were going home, he would have headed yes. in the western We know direction. he has offices in the Capitol itself. He has the vice presidential offices there, which he occupied as the vice president. Even though he was not a member of the Congress, he was the presiding officer, as all vice presidents are, of the Senate of the United States. So he had an office there. And he had this office here in the executive office building. Mr. Johnson's great reputation was made as a man who knew how to run the giant machine that is the Senate. It'll be interesting now to see what happens to the Senate. President Johnson left his office in the executive office building to attend a special memorial service at St. John's Church, which is directly across uh, the square from the White House. President Johnson met with former President Eisenhower for 25 minutes in the... Uh, in the vice presidential office in the executive office building and we understand that uh, during the 25 minutes each sat in a large leather chair it's a rather large desk and uh, they were straining to hear one another uh, we do not know what they talked about as yet but apparently we're discussing uh, problems of state and I'm sure that uh, President Johnson was asking for advice from the former chief executive anything he might be able to tell him about being the President of the United States. Right now inside the White House, there's a briefing by new Secretary Salinger. We hope when it's over, one of our correspondents will come out and give us details on the funeral plans. So far, we've not had any funeral plans. Nancy, have you heard anything? No, I've been over in Lafayette Park. We could see all the crowds running over there as soon as the word spread here in the rain that President Johnson was going over to St. John's Protestant Episcopal Church, and uh, we didn't hear any other funeral plans over there. I might say that as the bells rang out from the Church of the Presidents, for that's what it's called, as you know, uh, the crowds gathered, and, and they just stood there in the rain, soaking wet, drenched, watching with the reverence. There were about, I judge, a hundred worshipers in the church. It was a special memorial service. It didn't last very long. There were no hymns. There were just prayers, prayers led by the rector. And um, I don't know what else is going to happen right now. The visitors still continue to come into the White House to pay their last respects to the remains of President John F. Kennedy. But as we now move in to the afternoon, we're going to start seeing the arrival, I believe, of the diplomatic, no, the judiciary. The federal judiciary will be coming in the early afternoon, and then they will be followed by the diplomats. And I think it's also expected to be announced in this briefing that any of those reporters who covered the White House can go over there at 7 o'clock this evening to pay their last respects to uh, the late President Kennedy. When will the first time be that the public can pay their last respects? That'll be tomorrow when uh, the body is taken to the rotunda of the Capitol. And uh, it will stay there until Monday morning when it will be removed to St. Matthew's Church for the High Requiem Mass, which uh, Richard Cardinal Cushing of Boston, a very close family friend, to celebrate the Mass at that time. And then, I should judge that if the President is not buried in Washington, he will be buried in the Kennedy family plot in Brookline, Massachusetts, the suburb of Boston where he was born. They have a family plot. We knew nothing about it until this summer. Remember, two days after the death of their infant son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, it was announced that in Holyhood Cemetery, there was a Kennedy family plot, and that was where their infant son was buried. You remember Mrs. Kennedy didn't go. She stayed at Hyannisport and Otis Air Force Base Hospital. But young Patrick Bouvier was the first one to be buried in that plot, isn't that right? Kennedy? He was the first one to be buried in that plot. The Kennedy family has had many deaths. It had the death of Joe Jr., the oldest son, killed during the Second World War as a Navy flyer. It had the death of Kathleen, the eldest daughter, who was killed in an air crash in France, and now Patrick Bouvier and John F. Kennedy. Behind the closed doors of the homicide office, Lee Oswald is being questioned about the killing of President Kennedy. At the other end of the hall, Chief Jesse Curry is answering questions concerning the events leading up to the arrest of Lee Oswald.
communist or Marxist? Is it slight well, difference? I don't know. Yeah, he, uh, they say he said he was a communist now. Well, Chief, did the FBI or your department have <coughs> him under surveillance prior to yesterday? No, sir. We didn't have knowledge that he was in the city. Did the FBI? I understand that they did know he was here and had uh, interviewed him uh, oh, a week or two ago. Did they warn you of his presence in the city? No, they had not at the, at the time we, uh, up till yesterday. Do you think they should have? Well, they usually do. They, they keep us informed. Uh, if we don't have knowledge of it, they usually, uh, in liaison with us, they usually uh, let us know when these uh, communist sympathizers or subversives come into the city. And uh, why they hadn't gotten around to uh, informing us of this man, I don't know. Can you detail for us Oswald's movements yesterday, before and after the assassination, as you know them now? All I know about it is that a man brought him to work yesterday morning. He had a large package with him, which we believe to be the rifle. Uh, the next we know of him, a, a porter in the building took him up to the sixth floor at uh, shortly after 12 o'clock. And uh, he was next seen on the second or third floor in a lunchroom in the building. By whom and after the assassination was this? After the assassination by one of the first officers that went into the building and the manager of the building. The right next there. the next knowledge we have of the man is when he uh, shot our officer over in Oak Cliff. Why is it that he was not arrested when the officers saw him the first time? Because the manager said he was an employee. He said, he's all right, he's an employee. Gee, and in the good. rush to go to get up to the floor where the shooting occurred, uh, the officer passed him on by on uh, with the uh, when the manager told him that this is one of the employees. Chief, are you aware of a letter that he is supposed to have written to Governor Connolly when Governor Connolly was Secretary of the Navy and when he was an enlisted man in the Marine Corps asking to have his dishonorable discharge set aside and which request was refused? No, I sir, I don't know. I bring this up because I have heard this report <clears throat> and it might indicate that his actual target may have been the governor of Texas instead of the president of the United States. I don't know anything about it. Is it your belief that his actual target was the president of the yes, United I States? Yes, sure, I think it was. I think do, it was him. Do you have any evidence to support that belief? No, sir. You Except have no? that he hit the president twice. I, and he apparently was an expert marksman. and He apparently was hitting what he was shooting at. Can you estimate the range from the window from which the shots were fired to the car in which the men were hit? I would estimate about 75 yards. 75 yards on the slant. <laughs> now, what did, did you find in his marksman? apartment, uh, Chief? Did you find some well, communist literature in his apartment? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Chief, you said that the FBI usually informs you if uh, these so suspected subversives are in a are in your community uh were there others uh, if for instance if they had informed you about oswald what would you have done would you have taken special precautions on him with the president coming to town i don't know what we would have done there is no normal procedure for this type of thing that's right do you think that the assassination could have been avoided chief i don't know how the fbi knew he was but they did evidently when did they tell you this, Chief? Yes, they, they told you yesterday after the incident. Did they yes. say what they had, what information they had gotten from him? If they had, they evidently, did they indicate that it wasn't enough to warrant telling you in advance? I don't know. Do Did you, you have think anybody under custody yesterday? Anyone else? No, we, we didn't have anyone in custody. We, uh, uh, we knew the movements of some people. How many? Oh, less than a half a dozen. Five. Were they being watched? Well, we knew where they were. His marksmanship, was that something he perfected in the Marines? or That I don't know. Chief, I hate to keep on you about the paraben test, but if it's on both hands, it would indicate that he handled the rifle. Do you know uh, what they I don't know. I, I imagine they took it on both hands. I only saw them taking it on one hand when I was in there. They were working on one well, hand. There's a, a report that detective, that one of the detectives, the name of Brown, and said that they probably did. Huh? This indicates this indicates that he only shot a gun. All I know is this: I have the information, not officially. I haven't had a report. So it's positive on both hands. You fire a handgun, will it show up on your hand? Yes, as opposed to a shoulder. What does a paraffin test prove, then, Chief? This proves that the man fired a weapon. But you believe he is the man who fired the rifle that killed the president? Yes, I do. Did the FBI tell you? 
From the office of Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry, we have been receiving details about the movements of Lee Oswald before and after the assassination of President Kennedy. The chief has made a point of the fact that the FBI, while holding Oswald under surveillance prior to the president's visit, did not alert his department of that fact. This is Tom Pettit, NBC News, reporting from the office of Chief Jesse Curry of the Dallas Police Department. Here's Sandra Van Oker with further details. Well, the briefing, as you know, is held in the fish room. That's not normally where it's held. We usually hold it in the press secretary's office, but it was so crowded it was held in the fish room. And I had to go around the back to get in. It was so crowded. And as I passed the president's office, the president's office is in a state of... The former president's office is in a state of utter chaos. All the personal effects of John F. Kennedy are being removed. The paintings from the wall are being taken out at this moment. And I saw one thing that seemed to belong to the new president, President Johnson. It was a sort of a plaque with a Lone Star State flag on it and uh, a six-shooter and belt hung on it. But the most poignant reminder of all of the president's effects, the late president's effects being removed, is in the fish room. There used to be a huge sailfish that was hung on the wall there. From their honeymoon. From their honeymoon, and underneath, there's just the plaque now, and the plaque says, Sailfish caught at Acapulco, Mexico, September 18th, 1953, by John F. Kennedy. There's sort of an eerie feeling in there now, as you see the effects of one president being moved out and the effects of the new president, President Johnson, coming in. Back there, I saw one of the president's brother-in-law, Stephen Smith. He's married to the president's youngest sister. And uh, they're probably trying to get everything out as quickly as possible. Mr. Mr. Seller just said that they were all here. Uh, Stephen Smith and, and his wife, the president's president sister, he said the, the Lawfords were here, uh, Robert Kennedy and his wife here. Apparently, uh, most of the family was here this morning. I understand, talking to one person back there, that there are going to be plans made in the next day or so for televising the funeral service at St. Matthew's Cathedral here in Washington. But uh, as you probably said, Ray, they've got no further details on where the internment will be and or I anything else. we would have cameras all along the line of march to watch the cortege as it leaves here tomorrow and goes to the Capitol. It'd be just like, in a sad way, what once was a triumphal motorcade. Same route. Same route, up to the Capitol just as if a president were to be inaugurated rather than to lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Some little vignettes happening here which uh, point up the tragedy this day. A moment ago, Nancy Dickerson and I were going across the street to see what President Johnson was doing, and we saw the president's rocking chair being taken out of the White House. Yes, both of them. One the tan, one one the rose-colored rocking chair. Those were also, you know, up in his Senate office when he was a senator. Very famous rocking chair being taken away to storage. These are being put in room 300 next door, which will be used as an office by Evelyn Lincoln, the president's secretary. Uh, you went up to see uh, President Johnson? Yes, I got in the elevator and went up to his old office in the executive office building, which is now the one that he's operating from. And there are many White House police outside. Uh, they wouldn't let me go very far and wanted to know, indeed, how I had even gotten up that far. There's not much traffic in the hallway outside of his office. It's uh, just policemen mostly. Nancy, you've been in that office many times. What sort of a place is it? Well, it looks like President Johnson's office is wherever they are. They're always done in a green shade. Also, there are usually pictures done by Salinas. Uh, an artist who is a favorite of his. Just recently, President Johnson has started collecting art from all over the world on his world trips. But his, the first artist whose pictures he has hanging in both his houses and in his offices is Salinas. These I are might all say over. that he, he is there now. He's apparently having lunch in his office. The last thing we saw was uh, he came back from church. He gave uh, Mrs. Johnson a, a goodbye kiss. She got in the limousine and presumably went to their house. He is now in the office and has a cabinet meeting uh, in about an hour from now. That's true, when he presumably will return here for it. Uh, who have you been talking to today? Well, Excuse me, among... I just interrupt you. Yes, the White House has announced that President Truman is arriving at 2.10 at National Air For uh, Port aboard an Air Force plane that uh, the President Johnson sent out for him. 40 minutes from now. Right. 20 minutes from now. 
Well, as I started to say, among some of the people I talked with this morning, uh, it was uh, Mrs. Gilpatrick, wife of Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense Roswell Gilpatrick, and he, she told me that just before Mr. Kennedy had left for Dallas, the president had called Mr. Gilpatrick and congratulated him on the job he had done testifying before a somewhat hostile committee uh, of Congress on the TFX fighter. And uh, Mr. Kennedy, of course, mentioned or was going to mention that TFX in the uh, luncheon address that he never got to give yesterday. But uh, Mr. Kennedy not only congratulated Mr. Gilpatrick, but he said, uh, don't worry about all that criticism. He said, after all, lots of people criticize me, too. It's a very moving story. It shows his uh, concern for those people who worked around him. I think that's the one thing you get from many of these people besides their shock and their, their disbelief is it's, it's that Mr. Kennedy, the president, was so kind to them and considerate of their feelings and their problems. Their personal feeling of closeness. Merrill Muller, do you have any questions? Just, just a couple, if I may, but I gather we're going to have a little difficulty with two-way here, but let's see if I can toss any at you. Do you have any word yet? We had word a little earlier from the State Department that the President had requested no resignations, none of the automatic resignations from diplomats. Do you have any word as to whether he has requested that also from members of the Cabinet? Uh, he had talked to Secretary Rusk about that this morning. When we talked to Cabinet members earlier, we asked if they had been asked to stay on or if any had turned in their resignations. Uh, they said that uh, that uh, situation had not arisen yet. They were going to see Mr. Johnson at 2.30 and presumably it would arise then, but we understand they are all staying. That's my understanding, too. It's raining harder than ever now, uh, uh, Merrill. The, the Guard of Honor stands at stiff attention in front of the White House. Uh, as of the moment, there are no, uh, no respect for being paid. Uh, that resumes about an hour from now. Yes, it certainly is wet here. I couldn't quite hear what Merrill had to say, but uh, I can tell you that it's extremely wet. But those people still across the street stand there in the wet, drenched like everybody else who's out here, and they don't seem to move the silent vigil that they keep. So that is the story here. Uh, every uh, few moments, uh, men, uh, the door opens and men take out more of the president's effects. We saw a number of pictures, a number of books, uh, the rocking chairs and the... It continues. They're being put in the room next door. Now, there are some of the things being taken across the street now. That's the rocking chair. One of them is beige, one is rose-colored, and they were specially reupholstered by Mrs. Kennedy as a present for her husband. This is videotape of the scene that you and I just chanced upon about uh, 20 minutes ago. We are going to bring you some shots of the White House at the moment, live pictures, and put in these live pictures a resume of what the East Wing looks like, the East Wing to the left of your picture. This is where the slain President John F. Kennedy is lying in a closed casket. These films were taken this morning. They are the only pictures so far allowed from the White House. These films were taken just before the dignitaries started filing past the catafalque at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. At the time these films were being taken, Mrs. Kennedy and her two children, who have, as Bill Ryan reported, now been told of their father's death, death, were attending a private mass in the White House with 75 relatives and close friends. These were the first visitors to go by the catafalque, technicians, newsmen, part of the White House staff, but this, as I say, was all before the catafalque and the room were officially open for the program that is going on today of continual visits by dignitaries from Washington, and later this afternoon, the entire diplomatic corps here in Washington will file past the catafalque as well. We are told that Pierre Salinger, the White House news secretary, reports that he does not know who informed the two Kennedy children of their father's death. Carolyn, who will be six next Wednesday, and John Jr., who observes his third birthday Monday, were told sometime last night. That's it from Washington. Now back to New York. As we have reported to you earlier, 
Um, President Johnson has asked all of the uh, United States ambassadors to remain at their post. It is presumed that he has made the same request of his cabinet members. Custom dictates that in circumstances like this, that every major office holder who has been appointed to office by the president uh, tenders his resignation so that the new chief executive can have a free hand in carrying on his own policies and furthering the national interest. Isn't that but even I, done, Frank, uh, when a president is re-elected? Uh, I think it is. I think it is. And it's not uncommon, I, I think, uh, to have uh, resignations undated on file mm -hmm. for almost any contingency. Yes. Uh, but at any rate, uh, President Johnson has elected to forego this tradition. He's asked all ambassadors to stay at their post. We presume he's made the same request of his cabinet officers. And uh, a message from Defense Secretary Robert McNamara to the armed forces indicates that a period of 30 days of mourning will be declared for the military services in which all festivities or functions of that nature would be canceled. Bill? Nothing uh, really, Frank, although I, I probably shouldn't say that, but we're dealing with uh, a story we've been living with now for more than 24 hours. There is this from Los Angeles just in. Uh, Aldous Huxley uh, died last night of cancer in his Hollywood home. He was 69 years old. It almost seems remarkable that there should be other news when we are dealing with a story such as this. As I know, uh, there is this tragedy on the wire about the death of all these elderly persons in the, um, in the rest home in Ohio this morning, which mm -hmm. we have... Uh, 65 persons. Which we've not reported at all, really. Uh, former President Truman, Harry Truman, should be arriving in Washington very shortly. He's scheduled to arrive there at about uh, 10 minutes after 2 Eastern Standard Time this afternoon. And I would suspect that as the day wears on, we'll be getting arrival times of the um, various heads of state who are making plans to come to Washington for the funeral of President Kennedy, which will be held Monday. So far, we know that um, President de Gaulle of France, Baudouin of Belgium, Baudouin of Belgium Prince Philip representing the Crown, uh, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, Britain's uh, Prime Minister, and as well as Lady Hume, his uh, wife. Mikoyan. And Mikoyan, uh, uh, representing uh, Soviet Premier Khrushchev, who, by the way, and if you were not with us early this morning, you may not have heard this, uh, returned from somewhere within the Soviet Union at, a, at an undisclosed point where he'd been making a visit, returned to Moscow and uh, appeared at the American Embassy dressed in black to personally, that is to say, in person, express his bereavement to uh, the American ambassador to Russia, Floyd E. Kohler. There is a, I'm, I'm just going through the copy that's been brought in, Frank. There is really nothing new. There's nothing that carries the story forward anymore. Um, I think we might, for a moment, dwell on what is going on in Dallas, um, where Lee Oswald has been arrested. Another man has also been arrested, uh, Joe Rodriguez Molina has been taken into custody. Uh, there is, as far as we know, no charge yet placed against him. Uh, Oswald has refused to take a lie detector test. He said, I don't have to and I don't want to. Uh, we are told that uh, paraffin tests run on Oswald's hands uh, have indicated that uh, he did fire a weapon. Uh, there are traces of gunpowder that, gun powder that were found uh, in the paraffin test. A paraffin test was also made on his cheek which is, of course, where uh, his face would rest if he had fired a rifle. But we have no report on uh, the result of that test. Um, it is also said by the police chief that uh, Oswald has said uh, he's a communist. Uh, last night it was that he was a Marxist. Uh, chief Jesse Curry of the Dallas Police Force says today that Oswald sees no difference between the two. They're interchangeable as far as he's concerned. It has been raining throughout the morning in Washington, and uh, rain-soaked crowds, not large at all, have gathered in uh, Lafayette Park, directly across from the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, no one, perhaps least of all themselves, could really say why they are there, uh, but certainly uh, their presence there is understandable. It's sort of a mute and stricken testimony to the sense of loss that all of us feel, and uh, though they can serve no good purpose being there, they perhaps derive some comfort from being near the scene. Uh, and in this, in this fashion, they can at least um, give some sort of silent vent to the, um, to the emotions that they're feeling at the time. Yesterday, of course, was a day that was dominated entirely by the profound sense of immediate shock at the loss of the president. And as I think NBC's David Brinkley put it so well last night, in this day and time, with the uh, rapid increase in transport, the president left Washington, uh, went to Texas, 
was killed and was back in Washington in such a startlingly short period of time that this in its own way seemed to compound or add to the sense of shock that uh, all of us felt. Today, uh, the shock, of course, is wearing away and to be replaced with a dull, heavy, leaden sense of loss. I think it's uh, being replaced with reality, Frank. Well, I, perhaps I, I, so. I really don't think we had it yesterday. Perhaps so. This uh, <clears throat> can uh, perhaps account for some of the crowds who have gathered in Washington to stand in the rain, as it seems to always happen, across from the White House and uh, commune with themselves and have their own private thoughts. We go now to Richard Valeriani at Lafayette Park. There is a deeply human quality about the scene out here in Lafayette Park today. While across the street, President Lyndon Johnson and other high officials of the government have been going into the White House to see the body of the late President Kennedy in lying in repose, out here in the park, despite a gray, bleak day, despite the driving rain, people have been standing all morning, huddled under umbrellas, just standing and watching. These are some of the people who have been out here. What is your name, please, and where are you from? Ralph Cabello, Washington, D.C. What are your feelings of today? Well, it's a, it's a real bad day, but I'm happy to see so many people to come out and at least come by and uh, try to, uh, try to uh, express in their own way uh, how they feel. It's, it's a bad thing for uh, this uh, country, of course, and I think for the entire uh, world, too. Thank you That's very much. That sums it up. Thank you very much. What is your name, please? Eugene Margolis. I'm from uh, Alexandria, Virginia. How do you feel today? Well, I think that everybody has their own reactions to this terrible thing that happened to President Kennedy, but I think that this weather, this downpour, sums it up for everybody. I just think it's terrible. Thank you. What is your name, please? Dolores Birschbeck. And you're from where? Washington. And what are your reactions today? I still don't really know what to think. <laughs> I'm. I don't think I've ever felt so depressed about anything. I guess all everybody can do is just pray that everything works out okay. Our government is led in the right hands, and that's all. Thank you. Ma'am, what is your name, please? Uh, Edna Hinson Osborne, Macon, Georgia, and formerly Palm Beach, Florida. How do you feel about today and what has happened? I am so sad, and I, 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 I am lost for words. It's a great loss to the nation, to our country, to our people, I am sure that God will give us the needed strength to carry on. Thank you very much. Miss, what is your name, please? Would you just step out here? Sarah Higginbotham from Upper Marlboro. How, how do you feel today? Just terrible. I had no idea anything like this would happen in America. I know we've been having our bad times, but nothing like this. Why have you been standing out here? Well, I sort of had to see it, to believe it. I didn't believe it. it really could happen. Thank you very much. That is a summation of the feeling out here. People are still stunned, still shocked, and they've come to pay their final respects in, in their humble way to the president, the late president of the United States. This is Richard Valeriani, NBC News in Lafayette Park. In, uh, in these solemn hours, it's difficult to recall the late president in his more lighthearted moods. But lighthearted was certainly his frame of mind earlier this year when he visited a distant cousin in the Kennedy hometown of Dunganston, Ireland, and we'd like to recapture. Oh, Ryan, should we cut this? Yes, yes. What about it? Hey, cut your... Cut yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and he is now cutting a most uh, delicious-looking cake, which was made by Mrs. Fleming, one of the distant cousins. And on the top of that cake, although we can't see it, is a most pleasing and, I believe, a very edible figurehead just of President Kennedy. Thanks, Mr. Ryan. Give me a piece of one now. What? Give me a piece of one now. Oh, okay, here. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Don't even come off here, do I think? Yeah, they're all shy. <laughs> we want to uh, express our thanks to uh, Mrs. Ryan, who uh, she and her friends who cooked all this. I hope everybody who came with us from the country, the United States, all the press, everything will take something because uh, this was uh, a great effort on their part. We promise we'll come only once every <laughs> ten years, and. Uh, 
as I said, inside, we want to uh, drink a cup of tea to uh, all the Kennedys who went and all the Kennedys who stayed. You've been terrific. Oh, we're not going yet. We're mistaken. We're late. Don't mind them. Don't mind them. <laughs> what are we going to do with all that? The President of the United States visiting with his distant cousin, Mrs. Ryan, in Dungenstown, Ireland, and I recall that um, Hugh Mulligan, an associated press writer with unusual gifts, said of that day that, um, how did he put it, John F. Kennedy had flown higher and farther than any of Ireland's wild geese. <laughs> Uh, it would take a mulligan to write a line like that, I think, Frank. Uh, there is really nothing new to say right now. Uh, the president, his remains, President Kennedy, uh, lie in repose in the East Room of the White House. Uh, the family went in from 10 to 11 this morning, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, they were followed by uh, those whom President Kennedy had appointed to office uh, in his administration. And uh, they were to be followed this afternoon, and I think that may be going on now by members of Congress. Uh, later this afternoon, the diplomatic corps will uh, arrive at the White House to pay its respects. Newsmen this evening, then tomorrow, uh, the body will be taken to the rotunda of the Capitol where uh, the public will be uh, permitted to pay its last respects. There will be a, a solemn requiem mass said for the president, uh, a requiem mass said for the president on Monday in uh, St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington. Uh, Richard Cardinal Cushing of Boston will fly down tomorrow to uh, celebrate the Mass. There uh, still is no firm hard word on uh, where the burial will take place.